Hey everybody, welcome back to another Timer Tip Tuesday. Today's session is gonna be uh, another guest timer session. Um, we're gonna be talking with our friend Lowell Ladd here. He's a user of race day scoring and run sign up uh, tools in general. Um, he's a excellent cross country track and field timer and has a wealth of knowledge uh, to share with y'all. So um, we're gonna get started today. It's gonna be kind of an open conversation about his background, what he does, um, the kind of events that he um, provide services to, and uh, all the different cool things his business does. And then we'll be uh, going through a few questions that we had, and if you have any questions yourself, feel free to use the questions panel in uh, GoToWebinar, and we'll respond to those. So um, we're gonna get started in just a minute here. Uh, we do have some people still uh, joining, so I'll just give it one minute, and then we'll jump right in. All right, so it looks like uh, most people who plan on joining have joined, so we're gonna get started. Again, we're gonna be doing um, just a conversation uh, with a guest timer today, a little lad. Um, and we are recording this session, so we are going to share it on YouTube uh, once it's all recorded and completed. You can share it out after the fact and watch it again if you'd like. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll respond to you. So uh, let's get started. Um, so first off, just want to introduce Lowell. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, he's uh, one of our uh, big users of race day scoring, as I said. Um, also uses run sign up results a lot and has a lot of great, uh, you know, experiences to share with us today. Thanks for having me, Matt. You got it. So um, just wanted to talk a little bit about your business, 2L Race Services um, and 2L Race Timing. So the race services provides event management and the race timing provides timing services. So, um, I don't know, Lowell, do you want to give a little background to the company? Sure. Um, you know, I, after college, I got into college coaching for a couple of years, and then I did some private coaching uh, online for a number of years. I still do it a little bit on the side. And I was a college coach part-time for five years at Chestnut Hill College in Philadelphia. And shortly after that stint, um, I was out running a marathon myself, and afterwards, I thought, you know, I think I'd like to put on a race like this. It wasn't a big marathon. It was maybe 150 people in the marathon, another 300 and a half. And I thought, I, I'd kind of like to put on a race. Um, I was doing the online coaching thing. I thought it'd be fun to put on a race, maybe encourage some of the people I was coaching to come out and meet them in person because I coach a lot of people online and I never really met them. So I decided to start a race out in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I went to college up the road and have a history degree. So Gettysburg kind of made sense to me. So I started that and I just started with the event management side of things. And then after that, did that for one spring, started another race in the fall. After that, decided, you know, let's, let's just splurge and buy a timing system. We'll time our races and that'll kind of, um, be nice and tidy. And once we had it, got into offering timing to a couple other groups, and then it kind of spun itself from there to the point where we do a lot of timing now. And also I'm the race director for some races that started out asking me to time and said, hey, you put on your own race, can you direct it for us? And I was like, yeah, I can. I don't know if I have time, but I'm willing to have a go at it. So why not? Cool, so you really started in the road race side of things and then got worked into cross country track and field? Yeah, so I started with road race, you know, chip timing, yep. and I had some connections in the college coaching world, so I picked up a few college cross-country meets and was doing that, you know, not not a big thing, but did that for a while, and it just kind of grew over time, and then eventually we got into track and field, because cross-country people know track coaches, they tend to be track coaches, so they kept asking, hey, can you time track too? And I said, no, the chip equipment, I got to yeah. get a camera, um, yeah. so I... I I passed on that for a couple of years and finally said, all right, there's enough people asking me to do it. Why not? So got into the camera world. And then once I started timing a lot of track, it fed to more cross country timing, which led to more track. And so now we do a lot of both cross country and track and field. And then, you know, some of those people are involved with road races. So it also fed over to some road race timing opportunities as well. Very cool. So what's your, like, uh, like your ratio of events uh, in terms of cross country track field versus, um, uh, like running races? Track, or... This year we'll do about 175 events. Um, okay. as a estimate, I'd say we did about 80 track meets this spring, give or take maybe 90. So it's almost half of our timing is track and field. Uh, and that's just largely because there's so many track meets 
and more yeah. and more of them want timing. So like midweek, we get busy, like we're busy for about six weeks, pretty much every day except some Fridays and some mm -hmm. Sundays with track timing. But Monday through Thursday, it's, you know, we'll have two, three crews going every day and yeah. we're just busy. Um, yeah. Cross country is probably a quarter of our timing and then road races, mud runs, OCRs, cycling, you know, it's a smattering of other little miscellaneous events would be kind of the remainder of what we do timing wise. I like to mix it up. I couldn't really imagine timing like a 5k every single time <laughs> it would seem to get old. So I do like jumping around and doing different stuff at different times. Yeah, for sure. So we're kind of getting into it, but uh, it's, it's a good segue. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you're doing midweek events and you have staff coming in um, to assist with them. So what's that look like for you in terms of your staffing? Like, do you have how many full-time versus part-time for contractors do you have? And how does that work? Right. So I'm, I'm the only full-time staff. And of course, technically, I don't really count uh, to pay myself an owner's draw. Everybody else is part-time. Um, well, I, I could probably keep somebody busy full-time. I have one um, part-time staff member that when he's busy, he's working about 30 hours a week. So he's yeah. just about full-time. I don't know that he really wants any more. Um, I'm not averse to getting somebody else to do some full-time stuff because I could do without programming chips and organizing equipment and all that stuff because um, it kind of detracts me from what I'd rather be doing, but that's just kind of where we are. So I've got a bunch of other people. Um, we have a staff of, I believe it's seven right now. It's tough to keep track of people that jump in in 1099 versus the actual um, payroll, you know, part-time staff people. But I think seven is a fair number of the part-time people I have. Cool. And mostly you're using um, them for on-site services, not, you're saying like, you're not doing back end, you're not having them come into the office during the week to help with like coding chips or packing trucks. Right, Got right, it. that's pretty much all me. I mean, my, my son is 14, he's actually a head timer. Like I've sent him out to time high school meets and even college track meets um, as head timer without me there. And he could do that. So, you know, I've had my, him and my daughter have programmed chips before, but uh, they don't like it. So I, I try to use them for, for helping out with timing, whether it's at track meets or road races or whatever. I use them for that. And I just seem to get stuck doing the chip timing when I'm juggling other things, because it's kind of mindless putting chips on. I can imagine a kid get pretty uh, bored with encoding chips or sticking them on the bibs just over and over again. <laughs> yeah, they make up excuses like homework and things like that. All right, well, let's, um, let's talk a little more about the different kind of services that you provide. Um, so we're, we've discussed, you know, race timing was kind of where, um, you know, you, you added that, or did you, sorry, did you add race timing and start with event management or did you go the other I way? Did start with event management. Yep. That's, okay. So um, yeah, added on race timing and event management and you give, I'm assuming kind of piecemeal services, you provide services uh, so that- We do. It, it gets a little tricky to figure out how to price that out um, because if, you know, we've done some events for like a convention that comes to town and they say, we want you to do soup to nuts, like basically everything. That's easy, you know, because we know what everything is. When we have events that we time for and they say, hey, can you do some event management? Then it gets kind of tricky to figure out who's going to do what. Uh, I know we had an event eight or 10 years ago where it was not clearly spelled out who was doing everything. And they were upset that we didn't, you know, put deliver water cases out to the aid station on the course. And I said, you never asked us to do that. They just kind of assumed that that was part of what we were doing. So it does yeah. get a little bit tricky to, to go, drill down exactly who's doing what when you're not doing just, just timing's easy, doing everything is easy. The stuff in between gets a little bit nebulous, uh, but there's definitely a demand for it. Sometimes groups that are starting new races, you know, they reach out to the timer to start with, and they say, we want event management too. And when I get into it, I'm like, do you really need me to do stuff or just tell you what to do? And you go out and do it. If you're doing the legwork, a lot of times it doesn't take much time. I don't even always charge them. Yeah. And they often can do it if they're just told what they need to do. Yeah. So it's more of a consultation than anything else. You're not providing yeah. services. It's more like, hey, you know, you should put water at mile one, five and 10 for right. a marathon or whatever. Like, yeah, that's interesting. So it's a, yeah. Because a lot of them are nonprofits and they don't, you know, put on races like every weekend or even every month. It might be one a year. So they don't know what they don't know. And sometimes there's a revolving door with who's doing what. And, you know, it helps them to have somebody to bounce ideas off and ask questions to that's at a lot of events and been doing it for a long time. Cool. And course measurement is always a, a fun thing. I know I've done it before. Um, 
it's good to get your courses uh, certified for sure. It's a whole lot of fun to do yourself. Um, <laughs> do you provide that to a lot of local races? So I actually have never done it myself. So this is something that people reached out to us and asked, said, hey, can you do this? And I had to do it for my own race. I put on a marathon to get a Boston qualifier. You have to certify it. Um, I used other people. I had one guy who was great. He was super cheap because he was like 80 years old and he just did it for fun. Um, couldn't beat him for pricing. But if you pay somebody what it's really worth, it does cost a lot because it's pretty time intensive. So I got one of my staff members that I said, hey, you know, you're a triathlete. You like to ride your bike. How about you become our course certifier and learn how to measure and certify courses and do all the USATF hoops to jump through? And yeah. so I just handed that division of the company over to him. And, you know, part of doing it was just diversifying. I thought people reach out to us that were already timing for it. They want it as an add on. And then there's other groups that there aren't many people that do it, as you may or may not know. There's just not a lot of course measurers. So, you know, it's slim pickings and they start working through the list and they call people and they're like, yeah, I'm not doing it anymore. And there's just not many people. So they start with us and then that can feed over to timing some some events that they started wanting, you know, uh, someone to measure and certify the courses and they already had a timer. And then we've already got a dialogue going with them about doing that and it can kind of grow into timing for them as well. Yeah, I know um, from my experience, a lot of the people who are course certifiers are kind of aging out now or have been for the past like five, 10 years or so, because uh, it was kind of a very popular thing, I think, early days for road racing yeah. and just had a lot of people starting to age out. And, you know, now people got to go buy their own Jones meters and learn how to do it themselves. Um, but yeah, it's a it is a really interesting you know way to get new business if you see like, hey, you know, 2L race services has certified this course. They might, if a race got their map certified by you, they might want to reach out to you for timing in the future, or if someone else sees a map with your logo on it or something like that. That's yeah, good way to think about it. So um, as far as results go, um, you know, you guys have some really cool stuff uh, that I've seen you put up. Um, the big display boards and the race clocks. I'll show off some uh, little pictures of those coming up in a minute here, but. Um, so I guess on that note, um, you mentioned as well in the event management side of things, you provide a lot of different services and it's kind of difficult uh, to make sure that people understand, you know, what services you are and are not responsible for. Do you have like a a la carte menu that you uh, give people now or how do you manage that? I would that? say a menu. Um, I do have kind of a planning spreadsheet or not spread, a sheet that I use for sharing with new races that I've never put on before. And it's kind of a punch list of the things that you need to to do or at least think about when you're mm -hmm. putting on a new race, permitting, t-shirts, awards, all that good stuff. And I normally will send that to them and say, look, take this sheet and mark it up. Say, what can you do that you know of? Um, what do you need us to take total ownership of? And what do you think you can do if we can tell you how to do it? And cool. that usually is a good starting point for figuring out what exactly they need us to you know, put boots on the ground to get done on their behalf. Cool. So it's like more of a conversation you're having with them instead yeah. of you. Just yeah, doing yeah. not just like a checklist and order these things because there's too many variables at play and yeah. sometimes they don't know what goes into these things. So, you know, I don't want to, you know, undersell ourselves where they think, yeah, you just need to call the township and get the permit for us. And then you realize that you have to attend all these meetings and, you know, things like that, where it's way more scope than you realize. So. Sure. Drilling down in that for the discussion is is usually the best way to make sure that you're dialed in on what they need and what it's going to cost as far as man hours, you know, on our end. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. This is about you. We already kind of talked a little bit, <laughs> jumped ahead quite a bit here, but um, kind of talked through your history, talked through, um, yeah, there's some interesting things here. You have, um, you know, you're certified as a an official in track and field and cross country. Also, the FEMA Special Event Contingency Planning Tool. Can we talk about that? That's really yeah, that was forced on me, and actually, it was a good thing. Um, in in putting on my Gettysburg event, um, there were a lot of hoops to go through, and I could almost write a book about the challenges of doing that because in the early years, we had to deal with um, the State Department of Transportation, all the municipalities. We had to deal with the college that's out there, and the, the big surprise was. We ran through the National Park Service, and we thought because we were on a state highway that they didn't need to chime in on what we were doing. So I got all my other approvals and found out at the last minute that 
Um, yes, they do get to chime in and they can say no. And they do say no. <laughs> so that was that was not a lot of fun. Um, but in the process of getting those approvals, um, the one year they had to, one of the municipalities required me to get FEMA special event contingency planning certification to show that basically they don't want people going out there and putting on an event that is going to do a bad job and bring chaos on the local community. So they want to make sure that you're doing things the right way and you're thinking about problems, being proactive with that stuff. So I went through that um, certification course and testing to, to get that rubber stamp and certification. And, you know, it's good to have, it's, it's good to think about. It's not happy stuff thinking about, you know, where can a helicopter land if someone has to be medevaced out in the middle of your event? Like most people don't think about that, but, you know, if you put on, you know, a decent sized event that has some scope and scale to it, things like that, you know, one in a million thing. But if you think about them, then you know you'll deal with it better especially if you have a written document the other advantage of having that certification is like learning to write out a detailed event plan so you know if something happened any the day before the event someone else could pick that up and probably pull off the event yeah having it can't just be in my head yeah that's it. having a contingency plan written down is very very critical if something goes wrong like you said you know you have it written down you know, back cross jurisdictional on that scale and so a lot of times like one group doesn't, you know, one municipality doesn't know what the state has approved or, you know, th there's no glue other than you between those different things. And you reach out to one group to say what you want to do. And they might not care about what's going on in a different municipality or a different entity that has to sign off on it. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have that information just in case. Really interesting. Cool. Um, so we're getting, um, we're getting a few questions about like uh, specifics around FAT and links and the different kind of hardware that you use regarding like the chip systems. So we want to we can move on to kind of that part of the discussion. Um, let's just leave it on the screen. The yeah. Private. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, why don't you share if you feel comfortable with us? Just uh, you know what kind of hardware you use, uh, any experiences that you have with using that hardware, and how it's been working for you. So talk all hardware, or just the camera stuff. Um, all hardware, yeah. Because there, there's a few questions on like uh, the chip systems you use in conjunction with the cameras, as well right. as yeah, FAT. Yeah, cameras. so we we timed cross country before we had any sort of you know FAT camera system before we had finish links or anything. Um, and and in the early days, it was just a camcorder backup, um, yep. pre GoPro. I don't even remember what we used, but you know it was just roll a cam a video recorder, and if, if there was a missed chip read or if there was a close finish, we would go to that to review it. Um, so now we use Trident uh, UHF. We actually have dual systems, but I don't ever use the dual frequency. I just use the UHF. Okay. Um, so we have the black box mats, and we always run two of them at a finish line. So, you know, 10 feet apart. And we're using two non-foam tags on the race bibs. And we do encode our own. This is actually behind me, um, a Zebra ZT411. So we print and encode our own. Time and chips. And cool. It is cost effective and super convenient to do that. And so, as far as the, like the interface, we have um, so we have currently ten Trident systems. So really, we could time like you know five events on the same day, or we can we do split points. If we do split points, I normally you know, I've always sent just one out there, um, and our read rates have been really good. Um, I can't even remember the last time that we missed a split read with, even in rain with the non-foam tags, by using two chips, um, the, the mats just do really well. Um, cool. And so we put them out there with the Trident readers. And as far as remote goes, you know, we're using the Trident gateway to send them up to the cloud so we can do live uh, split data for cross country. As far as the interface with links, uh, we have four link systems and I would not time with without an identical links camera. So we used to at the timing vision camera looking down the line um, mm -hmm. that does the timing. And then we got the identifier, the identical links camera looking head on. We've got a couple different models, you know, older ones, newer ones. We've only been using finish links now for about three years. So that's a newer development for us. Uh, I personally do not bring the reads into links. I know a lot of timers do. I've done it in testing. I don't like it. Um, sometimes I just let it run and the, the reads go in there, but you can simultaneously bring them into race day scoring and into finish links. So a lot of times, you know, we're doing a reconciliation for like championship cross country. If it is a 
you know, a small cross country meet or an early season invitation or something. We may or may not use finish links, but if it has the word championship at the end of it, we're bringing the finish link camera and we set that up yeah. and we'll at least review the top so many people, 50, 100, kind of depends on the scope of the event, but we'll just go through and verify. We didn't miss any chip rates and make sure the close finishes are verified or adjusted, which is pretty easy to do in race day scoring. Um, I don't even know how long that functionality has been around, but you can just click two check boxes and swap to people um, mm -hmm. because we do get, you know, some close finishes. I timed a couple weeks ago, the NCAA Division Three pre-national meet out in central Pennsylvania, and there were about 380 guys in the race, in the guys' 8K, and I think the first 100 people went over the one-mile split in like 10 seconds. I mean, the density <laughs> was crazy. Yeah. Um, and I'll just finish Yes. So we did have a couple, you know, we had some places where I had to flip because my my personal um, sense has always been that with UHF, if it's less than two tenths of a second, you know, it's it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, the, can't, the, the way that the equipment is built, it's just not that accurate. If you go with an active system, um, which I do not have, then you can multiply that by five or 10 times and get it down to a couple hundredths of a second. But if it's less than two tenths, you better look at it. If it's two to four tenths, you know, it's pretty pretty darn good, but it will get some of those wrong. If it's more than half a second of separation, the UHF is basically always right, unless yeah. they get missed at the first map. So you can look at your reads, you know, in race day scoring and just isolate to see how many people had, you know, the first mat read it or how many, and just ignore that and say, how many people only got used by the second mat? And then you know the one, those are the ones that you really got to look at closely. Yeah. The other thing, even if you are using an active system, you know, typically those are on your shoe and the shoe tag, like, you know, it's your chest for FAT that you're really concerned about. So it, it, it may be accurate to the foot, but that might not be accurate for where their chest was. So it's always kind of, right. it's always kind of loose there to determine like an actual winner. That's why, you know, FAT is the way to go if you have to make a determination. You gotta have it. You're going to time an important cross country meet if it's, you know, close. You got to have it. Yep. Yep. Cool. Well, those are the questions on like the timing hardware we got. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the kind of setup gear that you have. Um, you know, you have a whole lot of, um, you know, barricades and structures and finished banners that you have and tents that your logos on them and all these LED leaderboards. So I'm um, sure there's a good amount to talk through here. Right. Um, obviously with, you know, tents and table claws and all that, that's just pump the brand, you know, get your brand out there as much as you can. We have a lot of trussing. Um, in the pre-Trident days, we actually used um, it hard, timing hardware that was antenna based with overhead antennas and side antennas. So we actually have a lot of global trussing. Yep. We tend to use the global trussing now really only to hang our LED board. Um, which was a COVID purchase. So during COVID, you know, everything shut down for the most part. I think we only had five months when we were down where we didn't have an event. I know, I think we did one in February and then the next one back was August, but it was lean for a while. There weren't many people that had, you know, the guts or the craziness to put on events. So we weren't doing a lot of timing and I was lucky enough to get some PPP money and you know expenses were basically none so i kind of looked at our business and i said what are what what would people like that we could do that basically nobody else is doing or very few people are doing and you know i've seen the led boards and i'm like i like cool toys um we have a trailer so you know some timers don't have trailer you need a big trailer to lug, lug around an LED, led board um yeah. ours is pieces so it's in two flight cases we have to assemble it every time if we had an assembled one on a you know permanent install on a trailer or something like that, that would be easier, but it would also be more expensive in another piece of equipment to have to try to haul around to meet. So ours is um, 12 panels that are one meter by a half meter. So we can make basically a 10 and a half by six and a half LED wall that can put anything on there that's on a computer screen. Yeah. And we started with global trussing on cranks to crank it up to make it easier. And now we try to do it more on full trussing. It's a little more stable with the legs on the ground. And we started putting banners on there to try to dress it up a little bit. Yeah, it looks super cool. I remember when I first saw this, you post about it. I was like, hey, that is super awesome. I bet people loves having us at their events, getting to see the results scroll by. Um, so I know I get a good amount of questions about this kind of technology. Um, 
And one of the things that I think a lot of people don't know is that, um, yeah, like as you said, these boards, you can, they're plug and play. It's just you are basically using it as a big giant monitor. So it's not some kind of special protocol or you don't have to hook up with a you know, serial port or something like that. It's really just a display and it's you can put whatever you want up on there. So anything that you can produce uh, results in that would look nice on a big display will work for these things. Yeah. So Sorry, the dog, was, dog was carrying on, so I had to mute myself for a second. So one of the, I know, uh, what's the most uh, interesting or fun thing that you've put up on a big screen leaderboard for a race? So we did it, we timed an ultra back in the summer, and it's actually two of my employees. So this is a, a couple that they, they put on their own ultra marathons, and they hired me to time for them. And then I recruited them to time for me, <laughs> because they know <laughs> the world. And I really do feel that race directors make outstanding timers because they get it. They get everything that goes on. They're a great resource when you send, you know, your timers to an event and somebody doesn't know what they're doing. Like if the timers know how to put on an event, they can really be helpful. So anyway, I've recruited them to, to time for me, but now when I go to their events, you know, they've partnered with the county to pay for things. So the like, LED board. Oh, hey, Lowell, we lost your mic there. Sorry, the dog was carrying on, and uh, I tried to not have you listen to the dog barking, so I muted myself for a second. Okay. But um, as far as the board, what we did at their last event was they have friends that help out, they volunteer, and they used to work for, I don't know if it's MSNBC, they work for some sort of broadcast company, and they've got like the broadcast, the high-end broadcasting software. So he said, look, I'm going to put you guys in your trailer, and you guys figure out some cool stuff to do. Um, and we did it first at their ultra back in December. And then they had like the same type of event, same location, just different lengths over the summer. So over the summer, they took a drone and they piped the drone video feed um, into their video. They, I basically gave them access to the board. And I said, here's this plugin. You just put whatever you want up on the board and you can jump around, overlay, all that good stuff. Um, the only thing they wanted from me, which was, key from timing and race day scoring was they wanted me to generate uh, a results file that was pumped to Dropbox or you know OneDrive, um, written periodically and, and give out certain fields that they wanted. So they had the drone video and then they also had, they, they built like a ticker like ESPN would have with the live scrolling results at the bottom. So they had the clock time in the corner of the event logo, they had the drone video of people running through and then they had to the ticker with you know how many laps people had done and their place and all that stuff scrolling through at the bottom. That's so cool. And so basically they wrote some wrote some software that just looks at a file and just goes through it and yeah. puts it into the just, into the yeah, plan. just map it out. Say this column is this data and have yeah. this many reference and all that good stuff. That's so cool. I love that. That's like one of the. I remember you telling me about this and I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, I know I would have loved that being being at a race, especially a lap race where you're there all freaking day. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, well, last December, the first time I worked with them, they actually, it was during the World Cup. And so they didn't have the drone that day, but they put the World Cup on the screen and they had the ticker scrolling the results. So that the, like, the spectators that were there wanted to watch the World Cup game, but then they also wanted you know, to see how people were doing during the race. Cool, cool. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's move on from this. Um, oh, just a couple of, yeah. Pictures of different leaderboards, like right. that looper race that you had done. Yeah, just, and, uh, you know, as far as what we did at the board, originally, the, kind of the early iterations were just taking um, the standard results, scrolling results that run sign up created. And kind of the next generation of that was using race day scoring to crank out kind of custom HTML where we could tweak what we had on the board. Um, you know, exactly what data fields they wanted on there that fit nicely. So with this one that you're showing now, you know, we had the male leader, um, that's a male and female leaderboard. So we could put those next to each other. The one thing I didn't do with that was to invert the colors because the board doesn't like to be run white. So that's yeah. something I need to be better about. <laughs> it takes a ton of juice to light it up like that. Oh, I can imagine, oh, yeah. Can imagine. So do you just do that with like Windows settings, just invert the colors of the whole thing? So at the like I used the board at the pre-nationals cross country meet and with that one we did the custom um HTML file driven by race day scoring and we just use Google Chrome and there's an extension where you can invert the colors. Okay, cool. 
what That's I'm good, planning you know. to do for the next cross country meet, I'm trying to teach myself how to use uh, OBS, open broadcast software, mm-hmm. and that can invert colors within it. And then you can do overlays and you can jump between things like smoothly and all that good stuff. So. That's yeah. my hope that I can do that uh, pretty soon. Yeah, I've used OBS before. A um, number of years ago, we attempted to live broadcast the symposium, and it was uh, crazy. Uh, we stopped doing it because it was too much effort, but I learned a lot that year, and it's a really yeah. powerful piece of software. Definitely would be is. really useful. Yeah. Um, just some more photos of uh, different things here. We're coming up around 30 minutes, so I think uh, we can go through these last questions, see if there's anything that we kind of didn't touch on, um, and then we'll open it up to uh, the crowd to see if there's any other specific questions that they had. Um, so, you know, any uh, any lessons learned that you've experienced you want to share? I think you kind of spoke on a few of them already, but if there's anything else that you feel like you want to share, go for it. I would say evolve. You know, I've been doing, I've been timing since 2011, so that's 12 years, and We've changed almost everything over the years from a timing standpoint. Hardware yep. for chip timing, hardware for um, camera timing, registration platforms, what we're doing with results. So, you know, technology evolves. And I mean, I, I see timers out there that present the results today the way they did like 25 years ago. And it kind of makes me cringe because you can do so much more and such cool stuff now. Um, so, I'm just one to push the envelope. And I'm like, you know, don't be set in what you're doing. Like, you don't want to change every week because then, you know, you're going to make, there's too much of a learning curve with that. But um, I'd say, you know, evolve, know what's out there, what there are for options and do new things. Yeah. It's a really good point. I know uh, when I was timing races, um, I worked, you know, full time for a timing company, event production company, and winters got less busy than summers, so it was always my task every winter to figure out what the next big thing we're going to do for the following season. And it's like, okay, now we're going to do um, like result kiosks or whatever it was, text message right. alerts. It was earlier, you know, a decade ago or so. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely really important to think, sit and think before your season, what's the big thing that we're going to do this year? What are we going to put out there that's going to make people, um, you know, excited to actually go to a race? And that's the most important thing, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. How did you handle staffing when you grew your business? Like, did you scale up pretty quick? Um, was it difficult to find people? You talked a little bit about the types of people that you like to find for part for part time I mean, work. It was and is difficult. Um, you know, over the years, I've recruited family members <laughs> to time for me, and sometimes it works great, and sometimes you know. They, they kind of do it to help you out. And while I appreciate that to help me grow, like ultimately I need people that aren't doing it as like a charity to me. Um, sure. Because, you know, I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty much busy all the time. So I need more staff and I don't have a great formula. I've really lucked out with finding some people. Um, the best resource has been recruiting people that have hired me to time for them to convince them to time for me. Um, those people have made great timers and I've really found them to be super helpful. Yeah, staffing is uh, always a problem, always a, you know, people aren't sure how to find people that work part-time with a difficult job, um, but, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's a rewarding job, and I liked it as a part-timer, you know, just, you show up pretty early, but hey, you're done by 11 a.m. on a Saturday, it's really nice. Um, right. So, let's move on here. Yeah, do you have much competition in your area, and how do you, uh, ensure that you uh, retain your events? So we have a lot of competition in the Philadelphia metro area, uh, but there's a lot There's a lot of good timers. There's some not so good timers. There's a lot of events. So yes. like I, I have shared race leads with several timers in the area that I know do a good job and I have like no apprehension about it. If, I'm, if we're too busy on a given weekend for whatever reason, like I don't want those races not to be able to get a timer. And I don't want them to get certain timers that don't necessarily do a great job. So I have no qualms about sharing the load with people in the area. So you got a good working relationship with others. Yeah. You know, if yeah you need. Part of it, right. And, you know, because we do, like, there aren't a lot of timers that do both finish lengths and chip timing, heavily, heavily in both. So, you know, because of that, like, Am I competitive with people in the chip timing world that might not be doing track timing? Well, those people are going to get track leads in all likelihood, 
And I want them to share those with me. If they're not going to get into using finish lens, but has a substantial learning curve, you know, I want to be on a good relationship with them so that, you know, they'll share those people's information with me. Yeah. So you're not treating it like it's a true competition. It's really like, hey, we're both in this together. Um, I, you know, little, you help me, I help you. Um, yep. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Especially in a yeah. big market like your own, like it's, you know, you're never going to get all of the events in the Philadelphia metro area. It's just not possible. Right. You had a hundred employees. Um, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, we took, talked a little bit about technology for timing hardware and scoring software. Um, don't really need to mention anything else on that, I don't think, unless there was something uh, that you didn't cover earlier. I don't think so. Um, so are there any features uh, with run sign up or like race day scoring you think timers may not be using their, their events but should or anything that you think is really valuable for your business? I mean, race day scoring is so powerful and complex that there's con I'm constantly finding little nooks and crannies or like my staff will tell me, hey, did, like I just did blah, blah, blah with race day scoring. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know I could do that. You know, like the swapping of the finish position. Like one of my staff, John, was telling me that. He's like, oh yeah, I saw this because I just watched a webinar on it, you know, and I was like, I, I didn't even know I could do that. Um, so, it, you know, it's it, it's something, it's like um, run sign up. Run sign up is super powerful. It also has a ton of little nooks and crannies that you didn't even know it could do something unless you had a reason to go in there or somebody else told you about it. Uh, so what what are those things? Um, I don't know, Not, nothing's coming to mind like off the top of my head. I do like the custom H, uh, result files that you can generate, you know, especially with the LED board, like that. that's huge for us. I know most people don't have one of those, but there's other uses for it, you know, being able to throw something into Dropbox to get it to somebody else for whatever reason. Yeah, definitely. I know that's one of the things that you use a lot. And uh, one of the features that not many people uh, know about is are those, you know, you can do auto saves in race day scoring to push results through and sign up to send it to a result kiosk, but you can also use the file option. So you can just automatically output an HTML file that's getting updated as results come in. And you can put that in Dropbox and do whatever you want with it. So there's a whole slew of different things you can think of that you could accomplish with having that functionality. We have the ability to make those files scrolling so they automatically um, you know, scroll through the finishers. There's just so many different options available to you once you start to understand the different functions that you have available to you. I think that, yeah, the, um, the HTML audio auto saves are a really cool feature if you are trying to do something with displays. So if you aren't using those and you're interested in display technology, definitely check them out. Um, let's see here. Do you have any partnerships with other businesses that help you bring in additional events of revenue? No, not really. Like, no, not really. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's move on. What are your, any current challenges that you're facing and how do you plan to address them? I mean, staffing is probably the biggest challenge. Like we're turning away work for next year. Um, yeah. You know, both in the spring with the track stuff, and then also even in the fall, where I'm already running into challenges. But both, you know, both cross country and track and field have the same um, challenge that road races have a little bit, but not quite as much. Is that they want better technology, like track and field. They're tired of stopwatches. People want FAT, and when when you when you bring FAT to an area, a league or whatever that hasn't had it at any of the schools, they all know each other. So you bring it to one school and somebody else is a visiting team at that school, they see it, they're like, hey, like, I don't have the time as a coach. They got a timing company that does everything and there's live results and there's splits for some things and all mm -hmm. this great stuff. So they want it and it spreads. And, you know, in cross country, you know, popsicle sticks were great for a while and they still have purpose, but more coaches say, I don't want a time. Like when I'm hosting a cross country meet, I don't want a time. Even if it's a quad meet or a tri meet or something, even dual meets will have us come out and chip time it because, and we could FAT it, uh, but we usually chip time it. Is that, that coaches want to coach, and you know they're starting to push back on athletic directors saying these other schools coaches don't have the time. You know they just coach at their cross country meets. So why can't we hire a timer? Mm -hmm. And I know it's that. About, you know, with the road racing world, there's still manual timing going on out there, but more and more places say, hey, I want chip timing. 
I want live results. I want, you know, all the nice things that come with that. It just, it grows. I know, um, I know. Uh, they used to have, or at least where I was based, they had um, cross country events and track and field events would have a set budget where they could just basically spend whatever they, you know, they, they, they try to get as many services as possible because they had a budget they had to spend. Is that the case that for you guys? Do you see that a lot? Not that I know of, but like in the, in the track world, especially price is rarely discussed. <laughs> like, honestly, it's just, are you available? Like they're so desperate for it that people just say, are you available? Mm. Um, and in cross country, there's, there's more of a price consciousness because it is, it's easier for the coaches to time cross country. So the AD is a big, all right, I'm willing to help you out a bit, but it's still got to work. Not like, it's not like they have to have it. Um, like some of the schools do for FAT. Cool. So let's talk um, business side of things. Any tools and services that you use to support like uh, your business in terms of insurance or accounting, like QuickBooks, or do you have anything, any tips on that side of the house? Uh, so I don't have any great tips. I mean, I'll tell you what I do, uh, but you know, I'm not, I don't have a business background. I kind of fumbled my way into this. So like I was, a, I ran in college, I coached cross country. Um, I have a degree, I have a master's in history. So I do not have a business background. So, you know, being a small business owner means jack of all trades, master of none sometimes. And, you know, I've had to learn enough to get along. So as far as insurance goes, uh, you know, we have to get insurance for the events that we own and operate, and we have general business insurance. And we got it for several years locally. We have we also have workers' comp insurance, and that's in large part because several of the universities that we work for will not let you work for them if you don't have workers' comp. Sure. And, you know, it's kind of silly because I don't have to provide workers' comp to myself as a business owner, and I might be the only person that's timing the events. So there's really no reason, but it's just one of those things. It's a policy thing. They yeah. say any vendor that comes here has to have workers' comp, and mm. you want the job, you got to get it. So yeah. you know, for a while, I got it through the state. Uh, they were tough to deal with. I finally found a way to get it through my payroll company. Um, so payroll has been, you know, important part of what we do. For a number of years, it was really small. I mean, you know, it was half the year I wasn't paying anybody anything. Now it's basically 12 months a year we're running payroll once a month, and it's a bigger piece. And we also get our uh, workers' comp insurance through the ADP payroll that I use. Um, I have no idea, you know, how competitive they are pricing-wise. It's we don't need much from them. I've had other providers that reach out and try to sell me on switching to them, and when we talk about it, I'm like. I don't need much from you guys. They say, well, is your is ADP doing this? Is, are they doing that? And I'm like, I don't really care if they do or not. I don't need yeah. to pick up the phone and talk to you every week. Like, just yeah. provide the coverage. Yeah, that's really all you're looking for. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, rainy day thing. If all heck breaks loose, you know, you just need stuff to be there as far as insurance goes in the background. And with the payroll, it's just, just do your job. It's not complicated. Um, as far as accounting goes, you know, I use QuickBooks. Um, I don't know that I use it great. My accountant a couple times has told me like you should you shouldn't be doing this. And I tweak it a little bit, but you know, I get my way along and it's better than the early days of using an Excel spreadsheet. Cool. All right. So moving on, some more cross country specific questions. Yeah, just in general, want to share with us how your uh, cross country events went for this season, it's approaching the end now, and any specific technology you use to support them that you wanted to cover. I think we already kind of talked about the kind of tech part of it, but. Yeah, I mean, cross country, um, I, I'm i amazed at how high the rate rates are with non-foam chips, because for years we were, foam chips are bust. You know, one foam yep. chip, that's all you need. And we made, when we switched um, hardware, we switched you know, our chips that we use and we just went to double non-foam and they're so much easier to stack. And when I had a number of events early on, they were high profile in the rain, and I kind of hold my breath, like, are they going to yeah. work? Are we going to miss a bunch of reads? Yeah. And we really don't miss reads at splits with only one thing there. We miss reads at the finish when they can wear a watch. And that's really what it is, is when they can stop their watch. Yep. Yeah. Always. And I time a lot in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Pennsylvania, high school, they can wear watches. And New Jersey, they can't. And so, you know, we see the Better difference between New Jersey. states. <laughs> yeah. Uh, always tell them hands up at the finish line. Yeah. 
And <laughs> I, I love getting more cross country meets to do splits, partly because you know I push live results and I say, you know, you can see, you know, your the splits for your kids mid race. You can see what place they are. Like all that's going live online. And I also like it because, you know, I work with the officials and I'll say, all right, how many people do we have in the race? Like, what's the count? And they'll give me the count. They're wrong over half the time. Like, they can't count bodies on the line. If I have splits, I know who's on the course because I see, all right, one mile, we had 173 people through and two miles, 172. And I'll tell them, somebody dropped out in the back. How do you know? I'm like, because we just don't really miss reads unless the kid runs around the mat. And, yeah. you know, I know what's going on out there at the course. So then I know what to expect at the finish line. That's amazing that you're getting such good read rates on on those chips. Because uh, I know I would be in the same boat as you. I'd be worried about it for uh, non-active yeah. chips. But yeah, it sounds like it's working well for you. That's that's awesome. Being able to rely on that data is critical. So um, let's see here. I don't know if we need to describe cross country how cross country events differ from regular endurance events i think we know yeah, cross country just briefly cross country is harder because every place matters you go to time a road race and half the people more than half the people they don't care like you can get their time wrong you get no time they get their finisher medal they're happy you know, give them the swag they're good cross country like everybody compares about cares about their place i mean mm -hmm. even like the last person in that race if you don't get a read on them you're going to hear about it from that coach and yeah. the team scores are all impacted. So you got to get every, you got to get a read, you got to get a time for everybody, and you got to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing that we didn't really talk about um, that's very important for cross country is like roster management and how you deal with coaches for getting the data. So yeah, I mean that's definitely a pain point. Um, you know, for for registration, run sign up doesn't support track and field and cross country. It's just not how they work. Cross country track and field is like the coach has a roster. They check off which kids are doing what. And, and you know, you got to use milesplitterathletic.net or there's a couple other options. We used to use, we still use a little bit. We use both. We use both, primarily athletic.net because it's easier as a timer. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest pain point is when, you know, you have an entry cutoff and you start putting, I, we put packets together. I don't know what other timers do. They might just give the bips, but you know, part yep. of our services, like we'll get that ready. We'll show up with a box or boxes of bibs with bib assignments and safety pins and everything. And you're good to go. You hand that to them and, you know, they don't have to worry about it unless they're going to add a course map or something. But it's good to go. When coaches miss deadlines, that's tough. If you find about it the day before, not as big of a deal. Um, if you find out about it, like I had one meet this year where nine minutes before the gun went off, a coach came running up to me and said, there's no packet for my team. And I was like, you're telling me this now? Like, really? You've been here for an hour and you're just now realizing? So that's not fun. You got to hand them some bibs and say, all right, write down, you know, who you have and what their bib assignment is. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, that's I mean, not fun. Colleges, they don't yeah. make that mistake as much, but it happens. And at least there they have the expectation of like substantial late fees. But you got to deal with some TFERS reporting, and you got to know those numbers. You can't just take their name and put in the results. So there is more of a hassle if a if a college team shows up without having done entries. Cool. And so, changes uh, are problematic too. You yeah. know, with cross country, if they if you've got multiple races and somebody runs in the wrong one, it I know that you can set the software to say, hey, if we see you at the finish line, we're going to move your division. But if you want to do live splits on the course and people are warming up and racing simultaneously, you need to know what race they're doing. And if they run in the wrong race, then they're like, why aren't I in the results? It's like, because you were supposed to be in the JV race and the coach just put you in the varsity and didn't tell us. It's always a hard um, decision to make whether you want to say, hey, you know, the coach needs to tell us where to put him or I'm going to try and determine that from chip data because – Right. Neither you can rely on because we know how coaches work and then we know how kids are running all over the course before a race with their chips on. So it's hard to right. make that decision. There's a learning curve with that and it's easier if you've worked with events and groups for years because you condition them at that point. But if it's a new group, all bets are off as far as how it's going to go. So it sounds like you prefer to get the coaches in line and have them tell you who goes where. I tell them I want to know as much as possible ahead of time. You know, I can deal with some amount of changes. Um, you know, we had for the one cross co college cross country meet, 
they had multiple distances. They had a, a long short meet. So men could run 8K or 4K, women could run 6K, 4K. And the coach didn't want to make them pre-declare what race they were doing. And I said, we can't do the live split data without that. And then they're scrambling. Finally, the day before, he's like, all right, I'll email the coaches and say, you know, try to let the timer know which race your kids are doing. So I start with everybody in one race, and then we start moving people. But we had to, we had to move hundreds of people race day. Yeah. And that's not fun to be doing that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Right, we're getting close on time, and we had a few qu uh, questions from attendee an attendee who sent these in before the uh, webinar. So I'm going to go through these now. Um, are reusable RFID shoe tags worth the investment? So I don't know if you've ever used it before, if I have an opinion on them. Never used them. I only use reusable for um, triathlon. Well, I have triathlon chips. So for triathlons or ultras um, or obstacle course races, we'll put a reusable one on them, partly because their bib can get shredded or whatever. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah, but, but so the first year I put on races, before I was a timer, the timer that we had at one of our events used reusable Ipico shoe tags. Uh -huh. And I said, never again as an event director, <laughs> because I paid for all those tags that didn't get collected. And when I got into timing, I said, I will never use shoe tag. I will never use shoe tag, ever. It's, it's one of those things that was always a, a trade-off. It's like, hey, we know the read rates are great. We know they're sturdy. You know, they're not going to get messed up. But you have to have someone who's willing to, you know, take the chips off of the people at the finish line after a triathlon. And it's soaking in sweat and lake water. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a trade-off. It's personal so, bias. You know, I was jaded from my experience 12 years ago. So they're asking a little bit about um, just backup uh, best practices. What they're thinking is going with a ground mat and a backup antenna at the finish line for chip reading. Is that overkill? They already have finish links as well. I mean, personally, I always want two rows of mats. Um, I know you could do one mat and then finish links, but... I want to I want to start with as close as we can get to good results and then fine tune things. Um, I know you can use side antennas. Problem is they're not that, and we used to use them when we had overhead antennas. But the side antennas aren't that accurate. So if you've yeah. got a lot of density, you know, just getting somebody and knowing that it could be could have read them way before the finish line, not super valuable. Like the mats we use, the black box black box mats that we have are not cheap and they're not light, but they really are solid. And we just don't miss many reads. So two yeah. of those finish links and a GoPro as emergency backup. And we also put the video from the GoPro on YouTube, and then we link it to the results. People like to see, you know, people buying yeah. across the line. I'm in the same uh, boat with you about the uh, those backup inside antennas that just capture absolutely everything. It just... It, to me, it doesn't really feel like it's that useful, um, and it just—you never know how far ahead of it they're going to be able to grab reads, and you really don't want to select a read ahead of the finish line. So you don't right. know how far back to put it, and it—it it seems like too much of a wild card for me to be to me for me to trust. Um, yep. Yeah. Same. Same on split, that. So. Split on the course. You know, if you're doing like a split on the course, yeah. then I would be more apt to do it. But I don't have any, so the mats serve us well. We just, you know, use what we got. Yeah, and so the last one here, um, their greatest concern is missed reads of the finish line, particularly when there's many runners crossing at the same time. Has chip timing advanced now so that this is not as much of an issue? I'd I mean, say. it's good. It's better than it was. It's not perfect. There's a reason that any important cross-country meet is going to have an FAT system there. Yeah. You know, if you've got three or four people that are basically next to each other, especially if their speeds are different, if somebody is passing somebody else, that's when it seems to struggle the most. If their speed is consistent across the line, it does pretty well, even if they're really close, but it's not perfect enough. Yeah, I think for this question, I think the read rates have been have gotten better. I think that the quality of hardware has gotten better, but to what you're saying, the accuracy isn't there. Like, especially for RFID, um, it's not there, and it's not going to be. Just the technology isn't built for accuracy like that. It, yeah, it can't be. I mean, I, I've never used race results, but I've watched some of the videos from them on how the technology works, and I found it to be really helpful in learning about, you know, what are they doing? Like, this antenna charges, it's up, over, and then it's resting, and then you got a gap, and then the next one. So, you know, all that makes sense, and it, it explains why it just can't be the accuracy level that you would need to have it be the sole system. Yeah, yeah. Just to be sure. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. Especially you know cross country, it's just you always got to use that finish length. I think as your primary because that's the most trusted thing you can have is line up the uh, the runners by chest, get your lines set properly. That's the uh, gold standard. I have an interesting example that kind of ties all this together. I timed a cross country meet, the, the long short one I, I mentioned earlier, and we ran finish lengths and we just made sure we didn't miss anybody. But because it wasn't a championship, I didn't worry about like verifying close finishes. I mm -hmm. thought nobody's qualifying for anything out of this. I'm not going to worry about it. So of course I used the GoPro, put the video up online. Late that night, I got an email from a coach who said, we looked at your video and your results are wrong. <laughs> said. This kid beat this other kid, and whichever one of them was first gets conference athlete of the week for our conference. So I said, I'm not going to do it off the GoPro. I'm going to pull out the links files, and I looked at it, and sure enough, you know, it was less than tenth of a second. And I don't blame the chip system for getting it backwards, um, but yeah. you know, interestingly, they, they picked it up because I used Run Sign for results, and I had a video of the results up there, and they went and looked and took a screenshot of it and sent it to me. And then I went to links and pulled it out. I said, all right, I guess I should have verified the first 10 or 15 or whatever. So that was a mid-pack finish, you were saying, that determined? Well, like 56 in the race. They were fifth and oh. six, but they were the, the top two from that conference. I see, I see. It was okay. like a Roman runner and a college in New Jersey runner that were like fifth and six in the race. But they were the first, I don't even know what conference that is, but they said whoever was first was going to get conference athlete of the week. Used to be Mid-Atlantic, but I, don't, I think they changed it around. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, we're pretty close to being done here, but um, were there any questions uh, from attendees that we want to bring up before we sign off for the day? Nope, we're looking really good, Avery. Hey, Lil, uh, this is James Harris. Just wanted to say thank you again. Thank you. This was really excellent material and uh, just really appreciate everything you do out there. And uh, thanks for using Race Day Sporting. <laughs> Yeah, so I just appreciate everything you guys do. You give me great tools, so I just like to play with them. And sometimes I break them, but Matt fixes them incredibly fast if I do manage I don't to get a little tiny crack. <laughs> James, James and the dev team fixes them, but we appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today, and um, thanks especially Lowell. You know, love talking to you, love having you. Um, so uh, we'll, I guess we'll talk to you all next time on the next Timer Tip Tuesday. And Sounds we'll good. see you then. Bye. Tip. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. Don't touch me. What's going on here? Knock it off. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and want to see more, please subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, and then all. And if you'd like to click the thumbs up button, I would appreciate that way more than you clicking on me. What was that about? Did you just squeak?